Let us turn together to Genesis chapter 37, and we read the verses 2 through to 36. And that's a story or an account that you and I are very familiar with, uh, and that is the account of uh, Joseph being sold away by his brothers in the fields near Dothan, in northern parts of Israel. And uh, let us see what the Lord teaches us, perhaps new things or old things which we have forgotten, and the Lord reminds us of again. So I start at verse 2b, uh, Genesis 37. Joseph was 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheave rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheave. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. My brother and sister, just a reminder of the geography. Uh, Hebron, where Joseph was and his father, that's quite south in Israel. And Shechem is sort of in the middle. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, What are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. Then the man said, They have moved from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And again, Dothan is still a bit more to the north of Shechem. So Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them at Dothan. 
When they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him in one of the pits. And we will say, A wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. And so it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him. And they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. And so Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in, in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's word. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, friends of ours have a 23-year-old daughter who eight years ago, when she was 15, had a diving accident in a pool in Palmerston North. This accident left her paralyzed from her armpits down. They had to fly her down to Burwood Spinal Unit in Christchurch. Three days later, I flew down to visit them there. The parents were devastated. And they were asking questions, hard questions. Why did this happen to us? We have then served God all our lives. We have always planned our lives and everything we do with God 
We are God-fearing people. Why? Where is God in this? And I know those people. I know them. I know they are godly people. I know everything they said is true. If something of this magnitude has never happened to you and me, and it never happened to me really, how do we know how to comfort such people? I can give them all the right Bible verses, but it seems that at that stage, even the right Bible verses did not work, at least from where I sat. I assured them that God does all things for the eternal good of those who love him. Romans 8, verse 28. But then the following question arises in the parents' minds. Eternal good? But were we then not already right with God? What about our present good, our well-being here on earth? My brother and sister, I had to remind this family, and you and me, that you and I do not see the bigger picture. We see only the back of a masterpiece tapestry. Our side, the side of the tapestry that we see is messy with wool and thread crisscrossing everywhere. And ugly, but God sees the bigger picture. He sees the good side. And in a way, that's what Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 says. The revealed things are to us, but the hidden things belong to the Lord our God. We do not know what God knows. But in his eternal plan, God, without being the author of evil and without being unkind or insensitive or mean, has decreed this trial for that family. Yet many a day they still ask, why? The same question which also God's people of old used to ask when they were suffering hardship. The same question which also Christians in persecution are asking. But why, O oh Lord? And the answer they get is, the revealed things belong to us, but the hidden things to God. And God works all things for the eternal good of those who love him. And if they could believe that, and if they could take that to heart, they will have peace. Well, by way of three points, our text explains how Joseph experienced this truth. And so sinful action is the first point. Evil reaction is the second point. And the last point, a silver lining, a small silver lining. First then, a sinful action. Our text tells us that Joseph was only 17 years old when he was at times shepherding the flock with his half-brothers. Now, although Joseph was part of a godly family, it doesn't mean that Joseph was without sin. In fact, our text reveals that at the young age of 17, Joseph, Joseph often acted in an unwise and even sinful way. Verse 2 tells us that he once told tales on his brothers and perhaps even exaggerated their mistakes to his, his father. And no wonder his brothers became bitter against him. But also the father, Jacob, had sinful actions. Verse 3, Jacob loved Joseph more than his other children. Wow. Children, 
this should never be. Parents, this should never be. How can a parent love one child more than another? But Jacob's sinful action went even further. You see, Jacob acted on his favoritistic thoughts by making a special robe for Joseph, a royal and kingly robe. Wow! Was Jacob with this present to his son? Was he not sending a message to the other sons? Was this royal robe not telling Joseph and his brothers that Joseph, young brat that he was, is the little ruler over the whole family? See Father Jacob's sinful actions. And it seems Joseph was wearing this robe of status where and whenever he could. No wonder we read in verse 4 that his brothers hated him and could not speak with him in peace, on friendly terms. But then Joseph's actions got more sinful, and his brothers hated even more furious. You see, Joseph had that dream, and in Bible times, God often spoke to people through dreams. But the nature of Joseph's dream was such that he should rather have kept it to himself. For telling others could sound like him being prideful, lifting himself above the others. Yet Joseph insisted on telling his brothers this very sensitive dream. Yes, in verse 6, we hear him say, Please, please listen to this dream I have had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. <laughs> wow, still today even a child will understand that this is not the sort of dream one should tell your older brothers. At least not without adding an, an apology of some sort. No wonder verse 8 tells us, his brother said to him, do you intend to rule over us? And they hated him. Unthoughtful, unwise, and sinful action of Joseph. <laughs> but Joseph would not give them a break. After all, Joseph then had a second very similar dream, and... Does this in itself not say something very important? <laughs> you see, in Bible times, dreams could, they didn't have to, but they could reveal a message from God, even if you dream only once on a specific topic. But if you dream the same topic twice, then surely that meant that the thing is fixed by God, and that God would shortly bring it about. Thus Joseph tells his brothers in verse 9, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold the sun, the moon, and, and here's the significant thing that gives it away, and 11 stars, not 12 or 13 or 2, but 11 stars were bowing down to me. Wow, now even Jacob exploded with rebuke, for the meaning of this dream is very clear. The sun is his father Jacob. The moon is to represent Joseph's stepmother Leah. And the 11 stars can only be Joseph's 11 brothers. They all will bow down to Joseph. Although Father Jacob was upset by Joseph's dream, he nevertheless, as verse 11 says, kept the saying in his mind. After all, did not he himself also in his younger days receive prophetic dreams from God? But Joseph's brothers, verse 11 reveals 
that whereas his brothers had hated him before, now they are jealous of him. And according to the Bible, jealousy is a more dangerous thing, for jealousy could soon spill over into violence. Wow, Joseph, but also Father Jacob with his sin marred actions, they have set the stage for a major confrontation. Soon their very own actions would backfire in the greatest trial on them. A trial which would cause them to cry out to God and to ask that why question. My brother and sister, sometimes you and I suffer evil which came to us without us initiating them. For example, an accident caused solely by the other guy. Yet it may well be worth examining our hearts and minds to see whether perhaps at times some of our trials, as in Joseph's case, have not come about as a result of our own sinful and sin-marred action. For example, people suffer of financial worries. Could they perhaps trace it back by their lack of dealing well with their finances? Or there might be a relationship breakdown. Why? Is it perhaps because I lacked kindness myself, showing it to the other person, not showing it to the other person? Well, an enormous trial was going to come over Joseph and over Father Jacob. And they're going to ask, where is God in all of this? And that brings us to point two, an, an evil reaction. One day, as verse 12 tells us, Joseph's brothers were pasturing their flock near Shechem. Joseph was not with them. No, he had stayed with his father in Hebron in the south. Was it perhaps again a time of good bonding between father and son? Perhaps even gossiping about the brothers? And then Joseph, then Jacob told Joseph, Go now and see if it's well with your brothers and the flock, and bring me word. Wow, but, but what would happen to Joseph if he would meet up with his brothers so far? My brother and sister, do you realize that that was 80 kilometers further away from Hebron? So Hebron in the south, 80 kilometers to the north, 80, there in Shechem the brothers were. So it's far from the safety of the father's home. Verse 18 through to 32 tell us Jacob finally found his brothers in Dothan. That was yet another 24 kilometers further north of Shechem. So now they are over 100 kilometers away from dad. <laughs> the brothers from a distance saw him come. And so they had time to, to quickly conspire an evil thing against him. And so how did they know from a distance that that, that was Joseph? Aha, they recognized the royal robe that he was wearing. And seeing that hated robe, that was enough to make their blood boil. Here comes this dreamer, they said. Literally, here comes the Lord of dreams. Come now, let us kill him and, and throw him into one of the pits. And we will see what will become of his dreams. Thankfully and in God's grace, the oldest brother, Reuben, intervened. And Joseph was not killed, but thrown alive into an empty pit. But not before the brothers had first stripped him of his royal robe. 
is not before they had defrocked Joseph, so to speak, of his special status as the ruler of the family. And so, defrocked Joseph was sitting in a pit with walls too high for him to climb out. And again, question comes, how must he have felt? Did he ask, God, why? Why must this come over me? Did he say, where is God in this horrible situation? If he didn't say these exact age-old words, then he would at least have thought or said something to similar effect. Yet we read that his brothers sat down to eat now, verse 25, as if nothing had happened. Of course, you and I know the story. While the brothers were eating, a caravan, a caravan of Midianite Ishmaelite traders came passing from north to south. They were on to the way to Egypt to sell their wares. And suddenly Judah, the fourth oldest, got what you may call a win-win idea. And this was the gist of the idea. Let us sell Joseph to these traders, then we don't have to kill him. What's more, we'll even get some money for our pockets. Three times repeating their brother's name, Joseph, in verse 28. And they pulled and lifted Joseph out of the pit. And they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. It's as if we see that a brother with a name was taken and sold. Unbelievable. Jacob's beloved Joseph is on his way to Egypt, not as a rich man, not as a free man. No, as a slave. What will happen to Joseph? And what will the brothers say to Jacob, the father? Well, they decided to go back to plan A. We will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. Indeed, the brothers decided to deceive their old father. And so they quickly slaughtered a goat and dipped Joseph's royal robe in the blood and sent it. They did not take it themselves and sent it to their father with this message. This we have found. Please examine it and see whether it is your son's robe or not. My brother and sister, this is not just evil, this is cold and insensitive. They deceived their old father with garments of their brother, just as their father once used his brother Esau's garment to deceive his father. And strangely, Father Jacob did not suspect any deception from his sons. He straight away believed what they had hoped he would believe, that a wild animal had devoured Joseph. Then, as was the grieving custom, Jacob, Jacob tore his own garments and put on sackcloth. And he mourned his son many days. And verse 35 tells us all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to the grave to Sheol, to my son mourning. And so the father wept for him. Father Jacob is heartbroken. He will mourn until the day of his death. Shockingly strange and, and unbelievably sad that his sons were able to let their dad grieve so terribly much, and yet they did not own up. They did not say a word. What evil action of human beings, of brothers, of sons. Would not Joseph in faraway Egypt, and would not Father Jacob in agony have cried out, but where is God in all of this? 
Well, Joseph and Jacob would not be the first nor the last to cry out, God, where are you? Many believers, many of God's loved ones, through all the ages, have cried the same words. Perhaps someone here, someone of us at the moment, is also crying out deep inside, God, where are you? How is it possible that I, your child, should bear what I am suffering at this moment? Yes, many have had to bear and process the death of a child. Many have had to face unemployment, poverty, pain, or strained relationships, war and persecution, or an accident that left them paralyzed like our friend's daughter. Many have asked, my God, where are you? How is it then that I, your child, must suffer as I am? Are you then not seeing my situation? Jacob was in bitter grief and mourning, and not just for one day. And if it was not so painfully real, Joseph could certainly not have believed that his own brother sold him as a slave, a slave that had almost no chance of ever getting free again. But that brings us to the last point, silver lining. My brother and sister, there's a silver lining to the dark cloud, to the nightmare of our text. You see, after nearly 35 verses of nightmare, the Bible author gives us one verse, just one, verse 36, to show that silver lining. A silver lining? Is that not what you and I should or could focus on as we ask the why question? Is that perhaps what my friends should ask for their paralyzed and beautiful young daughter? Should they see a silver lining of grace? God did not kill her after all. She's paralyzed, but through exercises she's able to slowly put one foot before the other, and she can study at university. Joseph got a silver lining. Here it is. Joseph is not slaving away in one of the many demanding building projects of the Pharaoh. Joseph has not become just another number among thousands of Egyptians downtrodden slaves. No, God cared for it that the Midianites sold him to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard. And thus, although Joseph is a slave, he is close to Pharaoh's palace. Even though Joseph's emotional suffering was severe, through this way of suffering, God would eventually exalt Joseph to the highest position in the palace. And indeed, his brothers would surely come and bow down to him. Joseph's frowned upon dreams were set to become true. God's plan for him is beginning to be fulfilled. But Joseph's brothers would not just come bow down before him. What's more, God will use Joseph to save Father Jacob and his whole large family from famine and death. My brother and sister, think what God's doings with Joseph years later meant for the people of Israel at times when they were baffled by evil things happening to the nation of Israel, when they were asking, where is God? Is he sleeping? 
Would not Joseph's story have comforted them? Would they not have gone, no matter how dark our circumstances, God is in control and he can overrule the evil deeds of people and still accomplish his savings plan? What extraordinary good news that God uses even evil human deeds to fulfill his salvation plan. We see this in the story of Joseph, but also in the story of our Lord Jesus. In fact, look, is Joseph not a type, a foreshadowing, a prefiguring of our Lord Jesus? You see, here are six points. Through Joseph's suffering and rise to rulership, he saved God's people Israel. And Jesus, through his suffering, death, and resurrection, would save God's people. Secondly, as Joseph's brothers conspired to kill him, so Jesus' brothers, the chief priests, and the elders conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Thirdly, as Joseph's brothers sold him for 20 pieces of silver, so Jesus' disciple Judas sold him for 30 pieces. Fourthly, as Joseph's brothers handed him over to Gentiles, so Jesus' brothers handed him over to a Gentile, to Pilate and the Romans, to kill him. And as Joseph suffered in silence, so Jesus suffered in silence. As God used the evil deeds of Joseph's brothers to save his people, so God used the evil deeds of Jesus' brothers to save his people. But Christ is far greater than Joseph. Look just at this one thing. Christ is God's very own son who willingly offered himself up to servanthood, humiliation, and scorn. Joseph did not do that willingly. Joseph saved Israel from an early death through famine, but Christ saved all God's people, including you and me, from eternal death caused by sin. And God used even even evil human deeds to fulfill his plan of salvation. We want to conclude. My brother and sister, more Christian martyrs have fallen in the last century than in all preceding 19 centuries combined. Surely many of them have cried out, Where is God? How can he allow this to happen? Why does God not do something about this wickedness? Perhaps you, a Christian and striving to live your life on God's terms and for his glory, are suffering hardship or injustice and evil from the hands of some people. May I encourage you to have another close look at the Joseph story. No, even better. Another look at the Jesus story and see that God is not absent. Even when evil seems to rule the world, the day or your day, God is in control. He is quietly at work behind the scenes and he is accomplishing his purposes. Remember also Paul's words in Romans 8 verse 18, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And even though you and I cannot see with God's eyes, Romans 8 verse 28 remains true. Now we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen.